Hello, beautiful soul, and welcome to our special extended video attempting to describe the true nature of God. The truth is, there are just so many ways that God can be expressed and described, because for thousands of years, God has been explored, revered, and worshiped by countless religions and forms of spirituality. In our original episode on this, we only covered a few expressions, and today we will expand our outlook to encompass even more. And so that you know, this episode is actually a bit of a forerunner for a much requested upcoming series about the nature of Christ and Christ consciousness. But in the meantime, if this subject is of interest to you, please check out our brand new Four Elements Transformation, which explores deeply the nature of Christ alongside the Tao and the mysteries of Kabbalah and the four worlds. We'll talk more about it at the end of this video, but now without further ado, let's see if we can't describe the indescribable. Wait, actually, that's the best place to start. Can we even do that? In the ancient Hermetic writings, Hermes said, the imperfect and impermanent cannot easily apprehend the eternally perfected. Can our human brains even conceptualize the eternal spirit manifesting infinite perfection through all of the dimensions of time and space and establishing the foundations of reality as we know it? Well, let's find out. Now for many people today, there's a lot of simple descriptors that are often drawn upon to name and describe God. Love, unity, source, all, truth, consciousness, spirit, father, mother, Christ, light. It's unfortunate though, that sometimes these terms are often used in place of the word God out of fear of saying the word God itself. It's understandable, with so many concerned about offending others today, Many people will choose to remain aloof with their words, even going so far as saying the universe in place of God, which may not be so appropriate. Certainly the universe is wonderful, but that's like praising the video game for creating itself instead of honoring the developers. Naturally, some today do believe the universe to be self-creating, but if that's the case, we ought to recognize that the self which creates the universe would therein be the pure beingness from which all things came. And so we're back to where we started, just arguing about which label to use. But concerning the existence of God and his nature, according to most ancient scriptures, it wasn't that humans just got together and decided they were going to believe these things about him, but that in most cases, God himself gave us these teachings in some form or another so that we may learn how to be virtuous, righteous, and just. Yet a common question often arises in response to this. Did we really need God to tell us to be good? Like the 10 commandments, for instance, don't you think anyone could come up with basic rules like don't kill, don't cheat, don't steal? Aren't those just naturally morally intrinsic within our conscience? Ironically, maybe not, because even the word conscience itself etymologically means faculty of knowing what is right originally especially to Christian ethics. Further, a lot of ancient scriptures say that humanity was awash with evil for a very long time, pillaging and plundering each other worshiping demons and killing for greed and power when it suited them. In fact, that's still to some degree happening today. And in this, we might consider, if a child is never taught that stealing is wrong or are even taught that it's right, will they come around to justice and virtue on their own or only once they are caught and face consequences? And if they never face consequences, will they believe themselves to be entirely in the right in everything that they do? From that perspective, Maybe we really do need some divine guidance. This brings us to the opening of how God has been described, which is that of law. What this means is that God has been described as a set of rules upon which the foundations of reality are based. We might consider the law of gravity, which we do not physically see, but can identify as operating throughout the universe. This is a really great way of conceptualizing God, especially if we have a more atheistic mindset because seeing God as the invisible laws underlying the universe helps us to bridge science and spirituality. Just think, if subatomic particles were not held together by any laws or gravity was inconsistent, would we even have a reality at all? You're walking to work one day and then you're flying through the air because gravity stopped working, but then it turned on again and now you're bawling. That would be pure chaos. By suggesting God is the forces within the field of reality by which all things operate, we provide a powerful foundation to work from for scientists 
and spiritualists alike. But we must be clear, God can be known through more than just cosmic law. In fact, one of the most common descriptions of God is that of a threefold nature. God is often said to have three key aspects to his being, or that we might more easily comprehend this supreme power by looking at it through a lens of three. This is very relative to sacred geometry, something we've explored in great detail on this channel in the past. In the major Western tradition of Christianity, God is described through the Holy Trinity. And in the major Eastern tradition of Hinduism, God is described through the Trimurti, as well as its feminine polarity with the Trivedi. But triune descriptions of God are found in more than just there. In Taoism, for instance, we have a threefold manifestation known as Yin Yang, Wu Wei, and Tai Chi. And Lao Tzu has also described God with a triad of concepts, invisible, intangible, inaudible. In Greek mythology, we also have the triad of Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, who represent the primal forces of creation, life, and death, among many other things. And pause for just a moment. Notice the geometry of their staves. Zeus always carries the big singular lightning bolt. Hades carries a two-pronged staff. And Poseidon carries a trident. That's not by accident. And we'll talk more about God and number later on in this video. Even in modern spirituality today, a very common lens to observe a human being is through mind, body, and spirit. And were we not said to have been made in the image of God? So let's take a moment to look deeper at some of these triads. Recently, we were watching Dr. Jordan Peterson's biblical lecture series, very profound stuff. And in the end of his first class, he breaks down an idea cloud of the biblical Trinity, which is an excellent place for us to start in understanding this concept. Of course, we know this Trinity as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's described that the Father aspect is something that we can enter into a covenant with. It responds to sacrifice and prayers. It transcends time and space. It punishes and rewards and judges and forgives. It is also beyond nature, which is very interesting. Closeness with it is heaven, distance from it is hell. It is also the law, which we have explored already. Now, the sun aspect is completely different. It is relative to language and vibration, the word of God. It is the body and blood of Christ. It is the tragic victim and scapegoat and the eternally triumphant redeemer simultaneously, which can rescue from hell. To the Christian Kabbalists, they would describe the word of God or son of God to be nested on Tiferet on the tree of life. This transition point between formless energy into substance with form and back again. The son dies and is reborn and is the king of kings and the hero of heroes. And finally, the Holy Spirit aspect in this Trinity is far more mysterious and is often understood more as a feminine expression of the divine. It is akin to the human soul, the prophetic still small voice or the spoken truth. It is called forth by music and is the enemy of deceit, arrogance and resentment. It is known as the water of life and is blinding light that burns without consuming. Now, all of this, of course, is just one of the trinities that we have to explore. So let's take a moment to look at the Eastern tradition of Hinduism. These aspects of God are often described as the forces found working through all things in the cosmos. Brahma is the force of creation in the universe. He is called the father of fathers, the golden fetus, or the architect of the universe. Brahma isn't worshiped so much today though. The idea is that he created everything and then left the rest to the other two. There's also some mythology where he screwed up a bit and got one of his five heads cut off and is still in the process of redeeming himself. Though it is said that the time of Brahma is coming again soon. Then we have Vishnu, who is the preserver and protector of creation. This force of preservation is one which keeps and maintains harmony in the cosmos. And then when things grow out of balance, Vishnu will incarnate himself into a form necessary to help bring harmony back to creation. As an example, Vishnu is said to have incarnated nine times in Earth's history, with his last two incarnations being as Krishna and Buddha, with a 10th prophecy to come at the end of a major cosmic cycle called the Kali Yuga. This in principle is very similar to the idea of Christ returning at the end of time. And finally, there is Shiva, the force of the destroyer. Shiva is interesting because just as he is known as the destroyer, he is also known as the redeemer. Shiva is the force of destruction to that which is old and brings renewal, recalibration, or restoration to that which no longer works in reality. Shiva is often represented as dancing, 
because through him represents the dance of destruction and recreation, which takes place constantly at fundamental levels of existence. This is actually quite significant because the deeper one goes into quantum mechanics, one learns that the waves and particles which make up our energetic reality matrix are constantly dancing together in and out of formation in different patterns, creation, destruction, rebirth, and renewal. In 2004, this very idea was memorialized at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, when India gifted a two meter tall statue of Shiva for the site. Now, this might be a good moment to briefly discuss the nature of idolatry, and if it's actually right or blasphemous to have literally any of these depictions of God or God's attributes in any particular way. Does God really look like a blue man dancing on a person, a big bearded man in the clouds, or a swirly circle with a couple of dots in it? It would likely be arrogant of any of us to presume we could describe an image of God. However, if we can understand that all of these depictions are human attempts to describe greater concepts than can be made into forms, then we free ourselves from the attachment to those images and can go beyond what we knew before. As many may recall, the first two of the 10 commandments reflect this, not putting any lesser gods before the supreme power, nor should we attempt to create images of that supreme power because it cannot be done. Yet this was even encoded into Hinduism with the concept of Brahman, the unity of the Trimurti, who is also known as the supreme ultimate reality and is represented by the AUM, three in one, pronounced Om, the sound or word of creation. The link here from Om in the West is the Amen, the resonant sound of the Lord. And as such, the Trinity of the Western understanding of God are said to be produced by the word of God, the vibration of creation. And we'll discuss this more in just a moment. Curiously, the Hebrew name of God, yod heh vav -Hey, sometimes pronounced Yahweh, written vertically, produces an image that looks like a human body. And this is said to simply be the supreme being from which all comes. It looks like a person, as we see in the Bible, man was made in the image of God. This being though, also is the unity that produces the multiplicity of all creation, which cannot be described or defined. And here's something that's really wild and possibly the most important thing we've ever discussed on spirit science to date. In the book, The God Code by Greg Braden, he shares that scientists studying human DNA actually found that the basic elements of DNA all translate directly to key letters of several ancient alphabets. And in these languages, our very genetic code spells this ancient name of God. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon, the four most primary elements within us translate to YHVG which is three letters similar and one different from the name of God. This further illustrates that we were made in the image of God, but not as God or equal to God, but slightly different. In Hebrew, the characters YHVG spells and translates two distinct words, God eternal and within body. The periodic element here, which sets us apart, linked with the Hebrew letter G is carbon, where the presence of God is reflected in the invisible and intangible form of the three gases, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, the last letter of our name is the stuff that gives us the color, taste, texture, and sound of our body, carbon. The one letter which sets us apart from God is also the element that makes us real in our material universe. Think about that for just a moment. Our very genetic code itself says, God eternal within the body. And this same code lives within all humans, regardless of their beliefs, actions, lifestyle, religion, or heritage. And this code also appears to work in the oldest, most ancient spiritual languages, including Arabic and Sanskrit. The odds that this relationship would occur by chance are approximately one in 230,000. And so continuing our mind-blowing escapades, here's another thing that's really curious. That cosmic being in the ancient Eastern writings called the Upanishads is referred to as simply the self with a capital S. One particular passage from these writings reads, Brahman is the immediate and direct, the self that is within all. You cannot see that which is the seer of seeing. You cannot hear that which is the hearer of hearing. You cannot think of that which is the thinker of thought. You cannot know that which is the knower of knowledge. This is yourself, that is within all. Everything else but this 
is perishable. We might find this paradoxically ironic then when considering if the universe is self-creating because according to the ancient Eastern mystics, that is indeed the case. And they have identified this self with the pure beingness from which the Trimurti itself comes called Brahman, which we also understand as the Om or the word. Yet here would be remiss to not identify that essentially all of these concepts are syncretically linked with Jesus Christ. This is because Jesus is said to have been the word of God. And so if Om and Brahman are the word and Jesus is the word, then are we not all discussing the same thing? While we're on the subject of syncretism, if Jesus is the way and the Tao also translates directly as the way, then isn't it appropriate to consider the deep intrinsic unity underlying such great world religions and spiritualities? And then since we brought up the concept of the Tao, triune descriptions of God are also found there with the triad of yin yang, tai chi, and wu wei. Wu wei is non-action, which is a state of perfect stillness, the force of unmoving manifested perfect wholeness encompassing all things. Then we have tai chi, which is the force of dynamic action through which all things in creation move and constantly swirl. Finally, there is yin yang, the force of balance between that which moves and that which is still. It is when yin and yang are in harmony that we find balance within and through balance, enlightenment. These three together are very similar to the concept of the three states of reality as described by the Upanishads, which are called Rajas, Tamas, and Sattva, which we explored in one of our previous videos on this channel. We can see therein also the principle of as above, so below at work. Just as yin and yang are considered forces underlying creation, they are also forces which apply to us. Lao Tzu even says, all living creatures carry yin and embrace yang. The flow of these vital forces together determines their harmony. In the same verse, Lao Tzu also shares something so simple yet completely profound, which brings all of these developing concepts and our understanding of God together. The Tao created oneness, oneness created two-ness, two-ness created three-ness, three-ness created all things. By this, we may see that whether we're looking at God through a lens of one or two or three or more, either way, we're not wrong. We simply must acknowledge that just as we saw with the Trimurti or the Trinity, all things are whole and united from the indescribable source. To add weight to this, here's a particular passage from the Hermetica, which describes the ultimate wholeness and unity of God. God is whole and constant. In himself, he is motionless, yet he is self-moving. He is immaculate, incorruptible, and everlasting. He is the supreme absolute reality. He is filled with ideas which are imperceptible to the senses and with all embracing knowledge. God is primal mind. He is too great to be called by the name God. He is hidden yet obvious everywhere. His being is known through thought alone, yet we see his form before our eyes. He is bodiless yet embodied in everything. There is nothing which he is not. He has no name because all names are his name. He is the unity in all things. And so we must know him by all names and call everything God. This really makes it easier to let the mind settle into the concept, doesn't it? Everything is God. And from that perspective, is there any reason to try and describe God at all? After consideration, it's probably fair to say that the answer is still yes, for it's in our own exploration to understand that we grow closer to that which might be called God and in that come closer to embodying these divine attributes, such as love, truth, goodness, virtue, mercy, justice, and so on. But there's another important thing to discuss after that passage, which is the use of the word he when pertaining to God. For thousands of years, God has commonly been described with the pronoun he, though today much speculation exists about why that is. If God is actually a masculine being, or if this is a reflection of masculine control structures placed on humanity for millennia. While certainly humanity has dealt with its fair share of controlling structures, there is another simple reason why he is appropriate to use. And this is because the masculine pronoun is often also the gender neutral pronoun. We see this built into our language today, such as when we say mankind, it refers to all of humanity, but womankind refers to women. This isn't shared with an intention to create a bias 
or caste division, to be clear, but to recognize how our particular language has been used throughout history. It's for this reason that one should not be disgruntled when hearing God when referred to as he, because it actually at the highest level refers to beingness beyond gender. And now with that said, there is also a case for observing God as feminine, which comes in a few forms. In the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu commonly refers to the Tao as the mother of all things. One particular verse reads, the true source is nebulous and perfect, born before heaven and earth, silent and void, unique and unchanging, cosmically circulating, yet inexhaustible and endless. It can appropriately be regarded as the primal mother of creation. And even in the biblical tradition, primary aspects of God, fundamental aspects in fact, have been attributed to the feminine pronoun, such as the case of wisdom and glory. Wisdom, for instance, was the means by which God created all of creation and is regarded as a feminine quality, as well as often a being of its own, at least poetically speaking. Similar to how Vishnu and Shiva are their own beings, yet united as a part of Brahman. And speaking of these Hindu gods, as mentioned, each of the Trimurti have feminine counterparts, which are known as the Trivedi. The consort of Brahma is Saraswati, who is the goddess of wisdom, the arts, and stream of speech. And together they developed the multiplicity of vibration and sound when creation occurred. The consort of Vishnu is Lakshmi, who also maintains balance, but through fortune and misfortune. Lakshmi and Vishnu are inseparable, just as yin and yang, and incarnate together whenever they manifest themselves into avatar forms. Finally, the consort of Shiva is Parvati, bringing limits to Shiva's destruction and balancing his unbridled passions. Parvati is closely identified with Prakriti, known as natural or primal matter, the substance of everything in reality fundamentally. She is also known as world mother or divine mother and is closely connected with Shakti, the active divine power through which the Godhead creates the world and displays itself. When we perceive the Trimurti and Trivedi together, or the creative power of God and his wisdom, we ultimately begin to perceive unity and balance between masculine and feminine principles in everything throughout reality. We might also see the union of force and field as two parts of a greater whole. And the deeper we contemplate, the deeper we come to know ourselves even better. And so, in that very pursuit of understanding, the most valuable thing each of us may do is take our own time to ask ourselves, how does this help us personally? When any of us take the time to answer that question, we each will personally grow closer to whatever God means to us and may even discover more qualities of God and ourselves in the process. It's probably safe to say that if we each embrace a little bit more of God, or at least if we have a more atheist worldview, the upright qualities which God represents, we'll all be a little better off, or maybe a lot better off. Yet, we must still remain humble because at the end of the day, just as Hermes described as we explored at the beginning, God is difficult to comprehend. Another way of saying this was put forth in the opening lines of the Tao Te Ching, where Lao Tzu himself wrote, a Tao you can explain is not the eternal Tao. A name you can name is not the eternal name. No matter how we may try and describe the infinite totality, it seems we ourselves are a union of three things, infinite spirit, finite matter, and the mind, a mix of both oscillating between these two states of infinite and finiteness in the middle. God must be experienced to truly be known. And for each person, that's their own journey. Perhaps it's also our collective journey too. And that might be the best way to describe God, not with words, but by the virtue of our own inner experiences. It's probably fair to say that almost everyone on the planet has had an experience that could be considered mystical or even divinely inspired, even in the subtlest of ways. Certainly, we may be quick to write off such experiences as coincidences or the like, but isn't there something to be said about what we take for granted being worth more than we sometimes think? And then the sum of our inner experiences collectively, when we see the big picture of what everyone is going through, maybe that could be described as God or the Holy Spirit or the Tao working through us all. And to that end, couldn't it be described that humanity is a giant field of collective consciousness vibrating together through the illusion of separation, 
manifesting a great shared reality field on an upward journey of self-realization, wherein we also do battle with dark forces within us so as to overcome them and unlock the mysteries of the soul, realizing the divinity within and one day all live together in peace, wisdom, and harmony? It's certainly a fun thing to consider. And with that, thank you so much for watching this special extended edition of our God Explained video. As mentioned, this episode is a forerunner for the new Christ series that we're working on. And we thank you so much for your patience. In addition to this series, we just launched a brand new course called the Four Elements Transformation, which draws upon esoteric Kabbalah, the Tao Te Ching, and the teachings of Christ in order to help participants purify and transform their lives and become aligned with wholeness, virtue, and live a life in harmony with the divine blueprint. This course is a new experiment for us in a way, which has launched with a pay what feels right model. Anyone who's called to attend this course and join the community is invited to do so. And we thank you so much for your contribution. Even the smallest amount can go a long way in helping us to create more content like this. And we're really looking forward to getting back to creating more consistent content week over week once more. Please use the link in the description to sign up and we'll see you inside the course and the community. Thanks for watching.